Welcome back, everybody. Part 19 of the Ecumenical Councils. I'm Jake Fowler here on the Paleocrat Diaries. Oh, man. It's been a while. I had to recover. I had to recover because I'm an introvert and going to travel to Michigan to see my confreres uh, was amazing, by the way. But when you get back, you just need a little downtime. You got to read a book, sit in a corner by yourself, do some introvert things. It's, it's strange. But it works, and here I am. So, back on track. This will be the second to last, or maybe third to last installment before we take a break and we look at some other things. We're gonna come back to history. We're not gonna abandon it all together. But I'm gonna have a few, at least one series intervene, right? A little tight-lipped about it for right now. Still in the planning stages. And I gotta worry about my new job, by the way. I gotta prep for my school that I'll be starting at in the fall. More on that to come. Hmm. It's July 6th. Ah, it's the fourth week after Pentecost. A ferry a day. No saint today. I've got a Manhattan. I've got an outline waiting for me. I've got some new books. Things are good. Let me turn down the music. Oh, actually, let me turn up the music. Check this out, everybody. My wife's business, Our Lady's Closet. See these dresses here on the screen? One, two, three, four, five, six different ones. And that's not all. If you go to Etsy.com and search Our Lady's Closet, you find a plethora of goods for your little girls. Modest, elegant, simple Catholic dresses. They're beautiful. Look at them. Look at those darlings praying, posing, really, but they're praying. Okay. Here we are. Get that out of there. Okay. Beautiful. So support Our Lady's Closet. If you want to support me, you can support her. She's sitting right over there, by the way, trying very hard to ignore the history lecture. She usually sits over there and falls asleep. But she doesn't like me saying that, so you can't tell anybody. Okay, where did we leave off? We were about the year 806. We were looking at some changes. The Empress Irene, who was the Empress mother of Constantine VI, remember she had him blinded in the room he was born in. It was a whole thing, and everybody was real ashamed of that. Well, she ran out of steam about 802, and a new emperor came to power, Nicephorus. And he installed a new patriarch after Tarasius died in 806, and his name was also Nicephorus. So we have two Nicephori ruling in Constantinople. The patriarch, he was a bold defender of images. He had been a bureaucrat in his previous life, so a lot like Tarasius, a layman, a government official, trusted by the emperor, just as Tarasius was trusted by the empress. Nicephorus, the patriarch, had been on the imperial delegation at Nicaea II, sent by Irene herself. Now, his take on images, like I mentioned, he was a Catholic. He was a defender of sacred images. He maintained that Christ's humanity was not dematerialized upon the Incarnation. This would have been an originist kind of thing to say. In other words, the human nature of Christ was concrete. And it had experienced the same things that the rest of us had, except sin. Nicephorus also argues that Christ's body must be depictable because that's the nature of bodies. Who ever heard of an uncircumscribed body, he says. In other words, it's in the nature of bodies to be limited. Bodies have size and shape. They take up space. And if it doesn't do those things, it's not really a body. If Christ isn't depictable, he must not have had a real body. And if he didn't have a real body, well, that's sort of like docetism, that early heresy we looked at a dozen episodes ago, or more than that, actually, that says, basically, the Son of God came down and appeared to be a man, 
but didn't actually take on human flesh. So Nicephorus is making his arguments for iconophilia, iconodulia, based on Christ having a true human nature, having a body, and bodies are depictable. The emperor Nicephorus, he rose to the throne in 802, didn't really last long, only nine years, although I will say that's pretty good by Byzantine standards. He was the first emperor in a long time to be killed in battle. Here's how it went down, basically. The Bulgars on the Eastern Front, well, it would have been the Western Front for Constantinople, the Bulgars attacking eastward were mm, kind of irritating Nicephorus a little bit. And although he was a pretty good commander, he wasn't as able as Leo III or Constantine V. Nonetheless, he leads his army in battle straight to the Bulgar capital, Pliska. And he sacks it. He just raises the city. It's a momentous victory. And he really puts the Bulgars on their heels. But he gets arrogant. In fact, he develops uh, one source. I think it was Jenkins in a re remarkable book that was one of the, the batch that I got a couple weeks ago. Jenkins mentions that Nicephorus suffered from some sort of mania that he got in this, this mode or this zone where that's all he could think of was pursuing the Bulgars. And pretty soon he's making reckless decisions. Well, one of these reckless decisions, or actually the string of reckless decisions, further estranged him from his generals, his son, Starasius, and three capable men, Leo, Michael, and Thomas. Nicephorus, imprudently, he stretches his army too thin. They're looting, they're pillaging, they're, they're kicking everybody's tails, but they're not being strategic. And the Bulgars, led by their Khan, whose name was Krum, the Bulgars attack by surprise. They attack the camp of Nicephorus. The emperor is killed in his tent. The others flee. Starasius, his son, the heir to the throne. He suffers a mortal wound in his neck, but he does not die. I mean, he does die from it, but not right then. He lasts several months. I can only imagine the agony that he must have been going through. Nicephorus is killed in battle, as I mentioned. The first emperor to be killed since Valens at Adrianople. And Krum, the Khan of the Bulgars... He takes his skull, Nicephorus's skull, and lines it with silver and makes a drinking goblet. That's a way to really show the Romans, the Byzantines, who's boss. Oh, your emperor? Yeah, I got his head. I like to drink my wine out of it. <laughs> Incredible. So, Starasius, as I mentioned, the son, the heir to the throne, he suffers a mortal wound in his neck, and months later, actually it's the following year, in January of 812, Starasius is dead. In the meantime, however, one of the generals, Michael, he ascends the throne. He's the brother-in-law of Starasius. He married his sister, Sarasius' sister, Nicephorus' daughter. So he was already kind of in the imperial family. And this is Michael I. Michael I is installed as emperor and takes for his theological advisor a certain monk, Theodore the Studite. Theodore the abbot of the Studium Monastery. Theodore was strongly orthodox. I don't recall if I mentioned him last time or not. He's extremely intelligent, born in 759. He had succeeded his uncle, whose name was Plato, as abbot of the monastery called Studios, or the Studium. 
Theodore's defense of the icons is similar to the patriarch Nicephorus, but it's based very heavily on the hypostatic union. So in a way, you could say it's very Cyrillian, taking after St. Cyril of Alexandria. If Christ cannot be depicted, Theodore says, this must be for one of two reasons. Either A, he does not have a real human nature, as the docetists maintain, or B, his human nature was subsumed into his divine nature, as the Monophysites say. So either way you cut it, you have heresy on the one side, heresy on the other. If you can't depict Christ, then you're either a docetist, you don't believe he really had a body, or you're a monophysite, you don't believe he has a true human nature, one that can be circumscribed and depictable. And that's where the overlap is with Nike for us. Because of the hypostatic union, Theodore goes on, Christ's human nature is inseparable from his hypostasis. And therefore, it is possible to have an icon of him. Recall, hypostasis is roughly equivalent to person. All the properties of the person are ascribed to their hypostasis, meaning if the person, if the hypostasis, has a human nature, then the properties of the human nature don't just remain sort of compartmentalized in the nature, but they're taken on by the person. So being depictable, being circumscribable, is inherent to Christ's human nature, and therefore it's inherent to his hypostasis. It's therefore Christ himself who can be depicted and not simply a nature. Now, Emperor Michael I, well-meaning, fairly reliable-ish, was weak. He was sort of just wasn't able to control Byzantium the way he ought to have. And he only lasted a few years. After a military defeat uh, against, guess who, the Bulgars, he's deposed. Now, the new emperor is crowned by the patriarch Nicephorus in 813. This man is Leo, Leo V. He's the second of those three guys I mentioned before, Leo, Michael, and Thomas. Leo was the military commander of a certain unit that deserted under Michael I in one of these battles, which was a significant factor in why he lost. So, kind of makes me wonder, did Leo do it on purpose so that Michael would lose favor with the military and the general population, and then he could kind of swoop in and proclaim himself emperor? Hmm. It's certainly possible. This is Leo V. He's called the Armenian. And it just so happens that when he ascended the throne in 813, he enjoyed a round of peace. Two reasons. Number one, Crum, the skull drinker, he dies unexpectedly. And so the Bulgars agree to a 30-year truce. The second reason is because of some internal strife in the Mohammedan Caliphate. You see, on the eastern front of Constantinople, the Muslims, they're menacing. They're constantly ravaging the frontier and, and killing the farmers and sort of taking land, and then they lose the land, and then they take it again, and you really can't grow anything here because they're just destroying it all. But they suffer their own internal divisions, as we see in, in any functioning government. So Leo V in 813, he inherits circumstances favorable to peace in the Roman Empire. Leo took this opportunity to reinstate iconoclasm, hence the title on the thumbnail, iconoclasm, now! 
It's imperial policy once more. Theodore the Studite, the advisor to Michael I, he's removed, as is the patriarch Nicephorus, who was an Orthodox Catholic. Nicephorus was replaced by a married layman, Theodotus. And Nicephorus was exiled. Theodore was exiled as well. I forget exactly where. Leo, with the assistance of an iconoclast theologian, a man named John the Grammarian, they hold a synod. It's the home synod. I've mentioned this before. This is sort of a recurring synod of bishops, uh, those who would report to the Metropolitan, the Patriarch of Constantinople, they would have to meet in Constantinople at regular interval intervals to discuss pertinent issues going on in their wing of the church. So at this home synod, John the Grammarian, uh, at the behest of Leo V, declares the proceedings of Nicaea II to be null and void, and they reinstated the Council of Hyaria, as the imperial faith. All this occurs in 815 AD. So we have Leo is in, Theodore and the patriarch Nicephorus are out, John the grammarian and iconoclast is in, and iconoclasm as a policy, as, a, as an imperial theology, is back. Now it's worth noting that this round of iconoclasm was slightly different. You see, it wasn't so much focused on whether or not images could be produced, but more on whether they could be venerated. So maybe splitting hairs a little bit, because what would be the purpose of an image if not to call the believer's mind to higher things and thereby venerate the image? Right? Calling to mind the angels and saints and Our Lady and adoring our blessed Lord in a crucifix or a statue of him. But the troubles really centered around the veneration. So take that for what it's worth. In 817, Theodore, while in exile, who, again, no longer theological advisor to the imperial court, he wrote a letter, along with some other abbots of other monasteries, to Pope Paschal I for assistance in the East. In their letter, which, by the way, is strongly papal, uh, in other words, these Easterners seem to have no qualms with papal claims. The abbots, uh, Theodore at the head, laid out the circumstances, and they sought support from Western iconophiles. Pope Paschal, in response, sends a delegation to the capital, but it had little effect. Theodore was severely punished once Leo V found out. He received a hundred lashes and was thrown into a dungeon. So not only in exile, but now he's at the bottom of some pit. All because he wrote a letter to the Pope. And the perse persecution continued until Leo's untimely death. Leo, you see, had a certain associate, another Michael, Michael the Amorian. Michael helped him gain the imperial throne from Michael the First in 813. So Michael the Amorian, in league with Leo V, helped to overthrow or, or usurp from Michael the First in 813. And he himself was a key figure in Leo's regime. The two of them, in the year 820, had some kind of falling out. And Leo arrested Michael and sentenced him to death. But Michael, well, he must have seen the writing on the wall because he already had a plan in place, or at least he was able to formulate one very quickly. Because the very next day, after he was thrown into prison, Michael arranged for Leo to be assassinated. Leo was cut in two by a, a man with a very large sword, probably a large man with a large sword, in the year 820 on Christmas, while he was at church. Michael was freed from the prison shortly thereafter, 
and was proclaimed Emperor Michael II while still wearing leg shackles. Still had his leg irons on because he wanted to get this show on the road so quickly they didn't have time to find the key. Soon after gaining his freedom and becoming the emperor, he had Leo's sons castrated. He's sitting around thinking to himself, how can I prevent these guys from being a threat to me? Well, you know, it's against the law for people who are disfigured or dismembered to hold office in Byzantium. So why don't we go right for the spot where nobody will doubt that these guys cannot serve as emperor? Four sons in total, the youngest of them, Niketas. He enters religious life. Now he's a eunuch, so what's the harm? Enters religious life and takes the name Ignatius. Patriarch Theodotus crowned Michael II soon after all of these events transpired to legitimize his rule. Michael II ceased persecution of the iconophiles. Don't get me wrong, he was an iconoclast. But I think he wanted to reduce the internal strife within the empire. He released Theodore the Studite, and he allowed Nicephorus, the former patriarch, to return from exile. He was not reinstated. Theodotus remained at the helm of the see of Constantinople, but Nicephorus was allowed to come back home, probably had some sort of residence there awaiting him. Neither of these two great iconophiles, once they made it back to the capital, were able to convince Michael II to reverse iconoclasm, and then they died shortly thereafter, Theodore in 826, Nicephorus in 829. To further his efforts at being somewhat moderate, Michael II reached out to the Carolingians. Now, uh, we're, we're speaking about the year 824, 825. Charlemagne has been dead for about 10 years, and his son, Louis the Pious, has been reigning as sole emperor. So, Louis the Pious, uh, like I said, reigning since about 814, receives the delegation from Michael II from Constantinople, and discussions are underway, but ultimately they go nowhere. Now, shifting gears a little bit back to the east, remember that third guy. We had a Leo, we had a Michael, we had a Thomas. Thomas, so-called the Slav, Thomas the Slav, he was a general, and he decides to make a run for the throne. 824, he has himself crowned emperor by the patriarch of Antioch, a man named Job. And then he, he has his army and he marches on the capital. The rebellion is eventually put down. And Michael II, again, think about the Byzantine brutalities. We had moms blinding their own kids. Right, we had an emperor getting his skull drank out of, although that really wasn't a done by the Byzantines. We had emperor deposed and sort of just whoosh, gone to the wayside. We got another emperor cut in half by a guy with a sword on Christmas while he's at church. And now this Thomas the Slav, he crosses Michael II. He tries to usurp the throne from him. And he's put down in his rebellion. And Michael II, he knows just the thing to do. He has his hands and his feet cut off and impales Thomas on a large stake and then posts the body so that others will remember. This is what happens when you try to take the throne from Michael II. I think this would have been a fairly effective warning. Now, Michael died about five years later in 829, the same year Nicephorus, the former patriarch, died. His empire was shrinking at the hands of the Muslims, 
and they were internally divided due to heresy. But for the first time in a while, we've got a peaceful succession of power. We've got Theophilus, Michael II's son, coming to the throne as Holy Roman, excuse me, not Holy Roman Emperor, that's Louis the Pious, Roman Emperor in the East. Theophilus reigns from 829 to 842, and he spent his uh, almost 13 years enforcing the strictest iconoclasm. Father Leo Davis gives us a picture of the horrors that were experienced by the iconophiles during this period. Jails were filled, monks driven from their monasteries. Even a well-respected painter was beaten, imprisoned, and he had his hands burned because after that he still refused to stop painting sacred art. So the tension is mounting. Iconoclasm is becoming more and more aggressive. The brutality is adding up. During Theophilus' reign, the patriarch of Constantinople, Theodotus, he died, and he was replaced by that iconoclast theologian from the home synod in 815, John the Grammarian. Now he's John the Seventh of Constantinople. He's one of the leading iconoclast theologians still. He was Theophilus' tutor when he was a boy, so Theophilus was already very familiar with him. He's the author of a certain catena, which is like a, a collection, if you will, a stringing together. I think catena means chain. So like a, a chain of patristic citations that seemed to support iconoclasm. These were used in that home synod of 815, the one where they confirmed the Council of Hyaria and they annulled Nicaea too. Now, this is all the more ironic because John was a prior associate of Theodore the Studite, who was the premier iconodule of the day, and John himself was a painter of images. At least until his conversion, you know, scare quotes around that, in 814. What happened in 814? Well, actually, what happened in 813? Michael I is out. Leo V is in. Leo's an iconoclast. John's looking around. He's like, hmm, if I want to go anywhere in this government, if I'm going to be a high-ranking so-and-so, I need to be an iconoclast too. I think it's funny when the Orthodox deny the charge of Caesaropapism, or they try to minimize it, like it wasn't really a big deal, it kind of gets overblown by the West. Oh, really? John the Grammarian is one example among many of theologians who just sort of went along with whatever flavor the imperial household was peddling at the time doesn't really make me want to believe them. When they say Caesaropapism is not a thing. Oh well. Now, at the end of his life, Theophilus lay on his deathbed pleading with his advisors. This is in 842. And he's begging them, please, please, please continue my policies of destroying images and persecuting iconodules. Because don't you know it, that's the way we've always done things. Well, not really, but Theophilus said it was. He died in 842. And again, this is not of murder. This is unusual by Byzantine standards. I kid, sort of. His wife, and now the empress mother, the regent for their son, her name is Theodora. She's in charge. Theodora was a devout Catholic she wanted to discontinue the policy of iconoclasm post-haste. and She was unable to do so as quickly as she wanted. Slowly, she enlisted the support of the leading men of the state. And they knew, since the boy emperor was so young, he was two at the time of his father's death, that this regency would be long. So they decided to play ball with Theodora. 
Besides, pragmatically speaking, the internal division was really bad for the empire. We've got the Bulgars. We've got the Mohammedans. Now we've got the Slavs. The threats are too much externally. And so the internal divisions have to come to an end. And if the empress says we're going to venerate images, then doggone it, we're going to venerate images. So iconoclasm is dropped, just like that. John the Seventh, John the Grammarian, he's out as patriarch. He was deposed in 843. The orthodox and courageous monk Methodius installed in his place. Methodius had been the one to deliver the letter from Paschal the First to Michael the Second in 821, which, by the way, got him eight years in prison. Nonetheless, Methodius is now Patriarch of Constantinople, Theodora, the regent for the boy Michael III. She is an icon of duel. She is a faithful Catholic. The persecution is over. It's immediately ended. It was like literally the next day. Okay, stop persecuting them. Images were restored to their former glory. Uh, sort of. Except... Images were sort of limited now. They're, they're mostly just two-dimensional. That's why the art coming out of the East is typically in the form of icons and mosaics. It's 2D. This is a scar from the iconoclast controversies. Statues never really made a comeback, just the way it was. A new liturgical feast was instituted called the Triumph of Orthodoxy. It was added to the calendar, always celebrated. I think the first time it was celebrated, it was March 11th, and it happened to be the first Sunday of Lent that year in 843, and the Orthodox and Eastern Catholics, for that matter, have maintained that tradition. Orthodoxy Sunday, right? The Feast of the Triumph of Orthodoxy. The first Sunday in Lent every year. And there's a really neat uh, section of the liturgy that goes along with that, where they anathematize all of the heretics. Um, I, I don't know the, the Greek chant, so I won't even attempt it, but look it up. Uh, Triumph of Orthodoxy, uh, Orthodoxy Sunday, first Sunday in Lent. It's amazing. Finally, in the year 843, 117 years after Leo III initiated this imperial heresy, Iconoclasm is over. It's dead. And the Christological controversies are through. Where have we been? Where have we been? My goodness. I have to switch the scene now. That's better. We have been over a span of almost 40 years from... 806, thereabouts, to 843. Now, I mentioned at the outset, this would be maybe the second to last episode in this particular series. I'm not sure. Maybe we'll do two more. It depends on how much we cover next time. We'll see. The Christological controversies, the controversies over who is Christ. They're over. They began with Ephesus. They concluded now in 843. The church is at peace once more. All glory to God. Hey, before we go, don't forget about the Wolfpack chat on Telegram. If you want to reach me at Jake underscore Fowler, you can find me on Telegram. Don't spam me. I'll just ignore you. But if you really want to talk, I'm there and I'm there for you. If you have questions, if you want to heckle me, I'm okay with that too. If you want to roast the Kaiser, we like to do that as well. It's t.me slash the Wolfpack chat. And one more thing before we go. Don't forget, right here you can see, I changed it from the blue one to the black and white one, Our Lady's Closet. That's sort of like, I mean, if you want to donate to Paleocrat Diaries Patreon, that's a great way to support the show. If you want to support the Fowlers in particular, then Our Lady's Closet, 
That's the way to do it. My wife makes these amazing dresses for little girls. They're really beautiful. Find her on Etsy.com. All right. I'm Jake Fowler for the Paleocrat Diaries. Here we go. You should never give up. You should keep on smiling. And you should remember that one day you will die. Cheers.